Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. It's easy to take the status of national parks for granted. After all, we read wonderful, beckoning stories about them in magazines and newspapers. We watch gorgeous travelogue pieces about them on television. But how much do we really know about the operational status of the national parks? How much do we know about the health of the natural resources, the condition of historic structures, the state of the workforce that operates and manages the national parks? In short, we know really very little about those things because most media outlets don't dwell on those aspects of the parks. At Yellowstone National Park, staff has been preparing State of the Park reports for some years. These reports provide some insights into these and other areas of the park. We'll be back in a minute with Yellowstone National Park Superintendent Cam Sholley to discuss this year's report. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. With Interior Federal Credit Union, you can rest assured your funds are safe. Credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration, the NCUA, which means that your accounts have insurance up to $250,000. Our members haven't lost a penny of insured funds. Stay protected and join today at interiorfcu.org. Welcome back to The Traveler, Cam. Great to see you. It's great to see you too, Kurt. So why, why do you prepare a state of the park report? You know, I think it's easy for us to go through year after year and in, in not just Yellowstone, but parks across the system. Uh, the, so many challenges we face, uh, but the teams across the system do such an incredible job. Uh, the team here is, is uh, no exception. And I think it's important to honestly kind of reflect the, the work of the team, which when you put it all together, and especially in a place like Yellowstone, is a substantial amount of really good work. And also at the same time, outline what some of those challenges are that we, we face today and will continue to face in the, in the future. And, and how do we, you know, it's super easy to focus on the negatives you know, what's the latest crisis of the day or the latest issue that we're facing. And I think what the state of the park kind of does for us is allow us to compile a lot of positives and a lot of successes the teams make in various areas of the operations and programs and to, to show that to the public, uh, you know, kind of what's happening here, uh, both the good and, and the not so good sometimes. I think that's important. You know, one of the, the sections in, in this year's report, you know, you you, conti- you talk about we will continue to strengthen the Yellowstone ecosystem and heritage resources by using the best available science and data to inform our decisions. Now, obviously, being at the heart of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, um, you've got partners in other state and federal agencies and tribal entities that have to share in that mission, No. Yeah, I mean, I think the Yellowstone is the core of the very Yellowstone ecosystem. You know, that's 2.2 million acres. The entire very Yellowstone ecosystem is, you know, depending on how you measure it, 20 million plus. And, you know, we're surrounded by five national forests. You know, we sit in three states and there's a lot of partnership and, and collaboration that is required for us to be successful. And I've always said that Every decision we make here in Yellowstone affects what happens outside the park and conversely, everything that's happening outside the park in many ways can affect what's going on here in Yellowstone. So everything is interlinked in in many ways and the better that our relationships are and our collaboration with our partners and the better priorities and strategies that we're setting, uh, especially in those areas that transcend jurisdictional boundaries, 
really is, is, is essential to the future of not just the GYE, but that plays out in many, many areas of the country. Sure, sure. Is that easier said than done, though? Uh, I mean, when you when you look at your your natural resources, I mean, the, the bison are a migratory species, the, the elk are a migratory species, so they come in and out of Yellowstone. And so, obviously, um, you've got to deal with uh, other stakeholders, so to speak, that may not have the same goals that uh, Yellowstone National Park has. Yeah, I think that that's, that, that's always a challenge. I, I think there are not only many divergent opinions um, within the public arena around how we should manage. Clearly, there are different state governments, local governments, others that you know have different approaches on things. What we try to look for is, you know, where are the co- areas we can find common ground. Uh, where are we focused on the things that are the most important, uh, not only to, to Yellowstone but uh, to states or other stakeholders? I, I think there's a lot of examples of success in, in common areas that we found uh, in collaboration. And then there's some areas that were divergent. And, you know, in those areas, you know, I think it's important for us to also try to look for common ground. The problem with that is not being able to reconcile some of those differences in approach sometimes can cause considerable rifts within public opinion on what we should be doing or how we should be doing it. And it's been interesting to see that play out over the last you know, several years with the wolf issue here last winter and then bison here this winter we're coming out of. I think that uh, those are some good examples of we've made great strides in, in wildlife conservation efforts that we've made uh, in many of those areas, but that's not always an agreed upon opinion by others, uh, other stakeholders that that have vested interest in how we manage wildlife in the park and how, you know, wildlife that transcends the boundary and potentially has impacts on on livestock or, or other uh, state interest. Those are, are things that we need to work through. But I will say, if you take bison and you look back over the last two decades, we've made substantial strides in how we manage bison. It's not perfect. It's probably one of the most complicated wildlife management issues I've ever been involved with. Uh, But I think there is something to be said about the progress we have made. And I think there has to be realistic expectations on the public uh, or by the public to understand the different dynamics that we're we're dealing with here and that we continue to try to make as much positive progress as possible, even when that's difficult. Yeah. And the bison issue, certainly you've taken a lot of criticism this year. Um, I, I don't know if it's deserved or not deserved. I mean, you look at the bison in, in Yellowstone, and they, they've been there for millennia, and um, there's always been the, this controversy. And yet, you know, as you mentioned, you you've made some great progress. There's a lot more bison being sent off to to some of the tribes um, to spread those animals down rather than than killing them or sending them to the slaughterhouses. Um, you grew up in Yellowstone. You, you're well familiar with the bison. Can you can you capsulize how how things have changed over the past fifty years? I say. Well, I mean, a hundred years ago, there was less than twenty five bison in the park. So I right. think that you know we we, were, we hit a record number, almost six thousand last year. Uh, so I, I I think if you look at the core part of bison management, which is is a healthy, free ranging genetically pure bison population we've done a good job of bringing that population back from from where it was a hundred years ago i think that if you look back at you know the 1990s and for most for people that are listening you know 60 percent of the bison population yellowstone carries a disease called brucellosis that that disease can under the right circumstances induce abortion abortions in in cattle um, there has not been a documented case of, of brucellosis transmission to cattle, but depending on which way you look at it, that could be because we've managed them very uh, strictly, so to speak. They're one of the only species that is not free to transcend boundaries the way other species are. There was a lawsuit back in the mid-90s that resulted in a, a mediated settlement between the state of Montana and the Department of Interior and Park Service that basically created two objectives. One was to ensure that we had a a free ranging, healthy uh, bison population. The second objective was to reduce risk of brucellosis transmission to livestock. 
both of those uh, objectives have been accomplished over the last 22 years. I think that's a success. Uh, There was a population target that was relatively arbitrary that was set of around 3,000 bison in uh, in the year 2000. We went above 5,000 for the first time in 2005. So very shortly after that, we exceeded 3,000. We've been above 3,000 over the last two decades. There hasn't been a time that we've been below 4,000 bison in Yellowstone in the last 10 years. As I said, we're, we're accomplishing the IBMP objectives. I think uh, the quarantine program that we initiated back in 2018, 2019, and then just double the capacity on that, which has allowed us to move um, more and more bison to tribal lands has been a, a big success. Uh, one of our main goals over the last four or five years is to reduce the number of bison we ship to slaughter. 12 years ago, we shipped 1,200 bison to slaughter in a single year. We've moved toward hunting and harvest, especially by tribes that have hunting treaty rights as a main tool to control the population. So this year, there was about 1,200 bison that were hunted by tribal and state hunters. You know, I, I understand that people don't like the number. Keep in mind, over the last couple of years, we've had light migrations out of the park. The numbers that we would normally try to control the population, we were unable to. So we had a year this year, we had a heavy migration and a higher number was taken out. And that's that's been the case n- numerous times over the last couple of decades. In 2015, the Montana expanded tolerance of bison outside of the Yellowstone boundary. I think that's a positive. A lot of people that want to see that tolerance expanded but that's a step. And so the quarantine program, the fact that we've accomplished the IBMP objectives with higher numbers, the tolerance zones, so bison can at least move out of the park to some degree. I think those are positives. Now, is it where we need to be ultimately in the future? Who knows? Um, But for, if you look at the incremental progress that we've made, I think we've come a long way, Uh, but there's no question that we have a long way to go still. Yeah. How many um, do you you think the population will be coming out of this winter? I think we'll be somewhere between 46 and 4,900. It depends. A lot of times these heavy winters, we have a lower reproduction percentage. So the normal reproduction is about 14%. So you take the bison population at 14% in, in a normal year. What we've seen in these heavier winters in the past has been a much lower reproduction percentage. So we think it's going to be somewhere between one and four. Uh, we dropped 1,550 out between 1,200 harvest. Uh, we put 282 into the bison conservation transfer program for live transfer to tribes. We did ship 88 to slaughter, which is one of the lowest years for that tool. Uh, but, you know, depending on what that reproduction percentage comes out at, uh, we think it's going to be somewhere in that mid to kind of upper 4,000 range. Uh, there's a lot to the bison story. Um, we're going to uh, put that off for, for another conversation because we, we've got a lot of other issues in your state of the park report. Um, I am curious about um, progress in, in coping with invasive and non-native species. I know the other poster child, so to speak, of invasive species in Yellowstone are the, the lake trout. Um, I know you've been making good progress on those over the years. That's a, an ongoing endeavor, right? Well, we're putting $2 million a year into uh, lake trout I just got a report about two weeks ago from the science panel, which is an external science panel that advises us on how we're doing and, um, you know, some very, very good progress. I think, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, a record low of adult lake trout, which are the, 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 the older lake trout are the ones that are the most impacting on the cutthroat trout, uh, cutthroat trout populations rebounding very, very nicely. Um, I think the last count was um, somewhere between five and 6,000 estimated adult sized uh, lake trout. We think we're going to get that number down. We've got multiple years left to do that. It's one of those things we've invested so much in over such a long period of time that, you know, it's important that we don't uh, lose steam on it and that we, uh, you know, continue to monitor what our progress is and what what the most effective uh, techniques are for for trying to crash that lake trout population as, as much as possible. We'll never get rid of lake trout completely. Uh, there'll be a point where the amount of effort and money that we're spending has got the lake trout down to the point where they aren't affecting the cutthroat as much as they were. 
but it's something we're going to need to stay on top of probably in perpetuity. A- any other um, invasives in particular con- you're concerned about? I know the, the park runs a pretty rig- rigorous uh, program to prevent the, the spread of quagga and zebra mussels into the into the waters of Yellowstone. Um, but you also have invasive vegetation, um, cheatgrass and whatnot. How, how are those looking? Well, on the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee, which is a, a combination of the superintendents of, of Tetons, Yellowstone, the five national forest supervisors in the three states, I think uh, you know, one of the areas that we're really on the same sheet of music on is is combating aquatic invasives from being introduced into the waters in, in the three states and the national parks, uh, national forest. I, I feel like there's a lot of room for us to improve. I think our inspectors are doing a really good job. I think it's one of the areas that we're pretty consistent with the states and other agencies around how we're doing inspections, but it only takes one. And uh, we've had a couple of close calls already over the last couple of years where we've detected uh, mussels and quagga mussels uh, on boats that were preparing to enter the water. Uh, it's an area I think we need to invest more in. And uh, that's not the only threat from an aquatic invasive standpoint. We had a smallmouth bass come all the way up to the Gardner and Yellowstone confluence last year. That's not a good sign. Um, we've had, you know, some other some other things that we're looking at on the aquatic side. On, on the terrestrial side, you know, I, I, I remain very focused on 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 cheatgrass, especially in the northern range of, of Yellowstone. I think that uh, any number of others, there, I mean, there's 223 non-native terrestrial invasives in Yellowstone, really figuring out the ones that are have the, the most likelihood for spreading and the most impacts on native species is, is what we're focused on. I think we've got a good inventory uh, and a, we're doing some really good mapping of where those invasives are coming in. I think the question is going to be, what are we willing to do from a treatment standpoint to combat them? And we were just talking the other day about uh, cheatgrass treatments and, you know, there's some pretty aggressive treatments that are available out there, but there's a lot of impacts that have to be looked at in, in order to, to exercise something like that. And you want to make sure that the treatments to take out one uh, non-native species isn't having harmful impacts on wildlife or other native species. So no question we've got to get better at uh, identifying which invasives we want to go after and how, but I think we're on a much better track than we were several years ago around the data and the science about how they're coming into the park and how they're impacting native species and what treatments are available for us to take to, uh, to minimize their impacts. Yeah. What's the concern with cheatgrass? Is it, is its ability to spread wildfire or yeah, is it's, it, is it- it's super dry? It pushes out native species. It's super flammable. Uh, it spreads very, very quickly. Uh, and that that's one that's probably at least up North here. It's, it's all over the Gardner basin and it's already creeping into the park. And so I've used this example before, but you, if you use the example of the lake trout coming in in the eighties and nineties and we saw a few here and there. What did we do? We watched it. We tried to, to, to take some actions. We didn't really know what we were doing per se. We didn't know what the magnitude of the problem was going to be. And really, how do we get better at predicting um, where the biggest threats are coming in? And it's not just Yellowstone. I mean, it's happening in the National Forest, it's happening in Grand Teton. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are probably some non-native species that are, are not worth the investment to address because they're not proliferating. They're not super impacting. And then there's others that uh, we really need to pay attention to. We're talking with uh, Cam Shawley, the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, about uh, the park's annual State of the Park report. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. 
As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. Cam, um, the recent addition of the best places to work in the federal government gave the National Park Service low marks once again. How do you go about making Yellowstone one of the best places to work? Uh, I mean, there's so many issues that you can control, but there are so many that you can't control um, in terms of, you know, salary. And I know you're trying to make uh, inroads on the housing issue, but how do you go about that making, you know, Yellowstone one of the best places to work in the Park Service? Well, we set a, you know, a priority back in 2019, you'll see in the state of the park called Focus on the Core. Um, after surveying a large number of, of people, housing was the single biggest issue that employees felt needed improvement, uh, especially from a quality of life standpoint. Um, second to that was their office environment, their supervision, the support that they feel that they're getting, uh, given the challenges that we're facing. And, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle. It's not, it's not an easy thing. I think there are, for instance, if you just take housing, you know, we've spent somewhere around $80 million in housing improvements in the last three and a half years. Uh, that that's substantial, but we've only touched about just over a third of the housing inventory in the park. And so if you're an employee that's living in in the third that got improved, your quality of life is better, you're happier, you're seeing that we're addressing some of your issues. If you're in the two thirds that hasn't been addressed yet, you're still not necessarily happy and, and wondering when are we going to get to, you know, some of the improvements that you want. I think that's 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 the biggest thing we 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 found with with the workforce was was the condition of housing. And we're I think we've got a good plan. It takes time. Uh, we're on that track. The, the the second big thing I think is just the there's a significant amount of mental health issues. We've had two uh, suicides um, by employees in the last several years, and this isn't just a Yellowstone issue. It's a it's not just a National Park Service issue. It's a, it's an issue across the country. But you know what level of support are we providing employees? I don't pretend to know exactly how COVID affected that. It does seem like there is a, a grayer area between personal stress and professional stress that kind of crosses over that's a little bit hard to delineate. But how do we as a employer um, do the best that we can to support the employees, to give them the tools that they need? You know, we're in an ever demanding environment, increasing visitation, increasing workloads, some cases, you know, flat to declining staffing. We've got some good support in a bunch of different areas. But overall, um, there's a lot of stressors on this workforce. And I think that, you know, it's not a light switch. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we can focus on to, you know, we just had a super all, all employee meeting last week, followed by an all supervisors meeting. There's about 130 supervisors in this park to really talk about, like, what are the things that are within our control that we're not doing that we can be doing better as a team, uh, supporters of, of an incredible workforce. And, you know, those answers are all over the place, but I, I think that there's a lot that could be done in the bucket that we control in, in regard to where we make investments, how we can make better decisions around supporting 
the workforce. And then there's this bucket you mentioned that, you know, we don't necessarily control. And even in those areas, there are things we can do to influence decisions and really kind of ensure that the workforce feels heard. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I hear is, is I just want to be supported. I want uh, to feel like I'm part of something. And that's something that we strive for. It, it may not be some huge multi-million dollar initiative coming from Congress or coming from Washington. It, it's more, you know, I mean, some of the best places that I've worked have been with the least amount of people and on some of the toughest issues. And so really trying to build that collegiality, uh, listen better to what, what employees need. I was reading an article the other day about, you know, a CEO that is like so many times employees have great ideas and we, we at various levels in the organization, we kind of say, nah, we're not going to do that or whatever. A lot of the ideas we put into place here come directly from the field. And what we're trying to do is encourage our supervisors and managers to kind of like, let it happen. If there's a good idea, let's try it out. Um, I mean, there may be some things that we can't do, but I think that uh, employees that have good ideas that feel like they're heard and get supported in implementing those ideas can also make a big difference in, in employees' viewpoints. Um, some of the metrics in the EVS are, are a bit challenging because you can't really trace it back to you know, what are the exact actions I can take to affect this particular category? But there's definitely, I think, a lot in there. And it's a, it's something that this agency and many agencies have, cha- have been challenged by for a very, very long time. If you look back over the last 10 or 15 years of those results. You know, last September, you launched the Yellowstone Resiliency Project, and that was a, a one-year pilot counseling program where you brought in, you know, some trauma-informed counselors who are familiar with the Park Service Values and Mission and trained to engage with employees. Is this something that will continue? Is it, do you need a full-time counselor on staff to be available for employees? Yeah, so we have five. Um, It was funded originally from Yellowstone Forever, which we really appreciate. It's been beyond popular with, with employees. And and the, basically the way it works is these counselors come in and they have open appointments that employees can sign up for, we have a special couple areas where they can go in and talk to the counselors one-on-one or the counselor will jump in the snowplow with them or jump in a patrol car or um, try to make it as, as easy as possible for uh, employees to access. We've just extended that for at least another three years. We've had a considerable number of partners ask if they can participate with it. Every single one of those available appointments is full. Uh, we've opened it up to spouses. That's another important thing. So I, I've always said there's no playbook for this. So I've had the unfortunate experience of being in several different operations in the national park system that have have dealt with significant employee mental health issues, and I I've yet to see an organization that's like nailed it perfectly. But I think we're kind of onto something here in relationship to the feedback we're getting from the employees that are using the, the counseling services. I think we're going to look to expand it. Tailing off of what I just said, and I, I mentioned this to all employees last week, is don't make us guess what you what you want. Like, I need to hear from you what you want, and then we'll try to figure out how to, how to accommodate that. I think too often, and I've been in this situation myself, we – we sit in some of these positions and think that we know or, or make decisions without all the right information. Um, this was really kind of a built from the ground up and it's, it's really gaining some good momentum. And I think the question is, is how do we take the feedback from the employees to make it even more successful in the future? But it's something that we're committed to um, over the long term. You'd mentioned uh, last June's flooding and um, Memorial Day is only a few weeks away. Where do things stand with recovering from last June's historic flooding and what sort of access will visitors find in the park this summer? I mean, aside from your your road projects, which I know are going to slow down some things. Yeah, we had a lot of non, non-flood, recover, uh, non-flood related road projects that will continue this year, Lewis River Bridge. Uh, replacement. They'll finish the the road between West Thumb and Old Faithful. You know, we were fortunate to get the road 
rebuilt here between uh, Gardner and Mammoth. That will be the the main road that we'll be using for the foreseeable future, probably at least five years. We're, we're launching a, either it'll, we'll see if it's an EIS or an EA process under NEPA to uh, evaluating multiple alternatives for the permanent road between here and, and Gardner. Great thanks to to the administration and the Park Service and DOI and Congress for uh, funding, giving us a substantial amount of, of uh, flood recovery funding that we have immediately available once we decide what alternatives we want to implement. Um, Northeast Entrance Road, the, the repairs that we made there uh, are really permanent. They're not temporary. In fact, someone told me the other day it'd probably be $20 million just to undo what we did in those three major damage sections on the Northeast Entrance Road. There's a section there at Lamar Canyon between Slough Creek and Lamar that is going to continue. They'll be starting that here soon to move the road further away from the river. You know, we're looking at some resilience. You know, when we look at uh, that corridor, what's the best way for us to address future flood events? You know, are there areas the road needs to be moved away from the Lamar River, from Soda Butte Creek? Are there other resiliency efforts that we can make? So I, I feel pretty good on the roads in the north side and the progress that we've made. And there's really not going to be any different types of access than you would see in a normal year. Uh, we try to do a get this wastewater system uh, up and running here in Mammoth. Most people that have followed this know we lost our wastewater line from Mammoth to Gardner. That was has been delayed by about six weeks. It's hard to, you know, a normal project to build a wastewater treatment plant is probably two years at, at minimum under ideal conditions. And we tried to do it in, you know, eight or nine months with one of the most difficult winters that we faced. But team's doing a really good job. I think we'll have that up and running sometime in June. At that point, we'll be able to open full services in, in Mammoth, including the hotel, restaurant, and the campground. So I don't, you know, I, I think generally speaking, the average person coming here is not going to see any real impacts from the floods per se. Uh, there'll be a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes. There'll be some obvious construction that's happening. I think some people saw we got the Yellowstone River Bridge funded. Um, that'll be that, that replacement project will be be starting later this year. That's going to be about a three year timeline. Um, so a lot going on. But I, I don't think it's going to severely disrupt visitor experience from, from any noticeable standpoint. You know, annual visitation continues to grow, um, staffing not so much. In 2013, the park had 521 full-time equivalent positions, of which 316 were permanent. Last year, you had 512 full-time equivalents and 308 permanent positions, uh, a little bit less than you did a decade ago. Is that problematic? Um, I know you can build in efficiencies, but there's only so much, right? You need people to manage people and you need people to protect the park. Uh, so there is a, a clear issue at some point where your visitation trajectory oversta- overtakes your, your operations capacity. And, you know, I think we've done as much as we can to try to keep staffing levels at least flat. I think there's been some really good Inflation Reduction Act. We've got some additional capacity from from Washington to hire some new positions. You know, obviously, we've been very successful with Great American Outdoors Act on the infrastructure side. But I think the real challenge, not only for Yellowstone, for, for many parks, is operational staffing that is at a level that is commensurate with the workload. And as visitation increases, that workload increases. And, you know, I've used this example many times. People don't think about it, but, you know, if you've got 2,500 trash cans that now have to be emptied four times a day instead of two, or, you know, 750 bathrooms that have to be cleaned three times a day instead of one, you know, that equates to more staffing, it equates to more trucks hauling trash, it equates to a number of different things and impacts on staff. I just talk about mental health issues. There is no question a correlation between the stress at work and the workload that we deal with and our workforce deals with uh, and, and that and mental health and stress issues. And I think that uh, we've done a good job across the system of managing very, very substantial increases in visitation in many units of the National Park System. I mean, in, 
50 million uh, visitor increase between 2013 and 2016. Most of that 50 million was absorbed by, I'm guessing here, but somewhere around 30, 35 parks probably. I would argue also that most of those parks already had high visitation. So we saw very substantial increases over the last decade in visitation system wide. That's dipped back down for a variety of reasons, probably. You know, last year we were at 3.2 million, which is like one of the lowest years we've had, I think, since, you know, 2010 or 12 or something like that. Um, that was an anomaly because of the flood. But my guess is this year it'll rebound pretty easily into that 4 million range. And, you know, I've said this, we clearly have to monitor what the impacts of increasing visitation are on the resources of this park. Uh, we have to monitor what the visitor experience is. That's very important. There's no question. But I continue to uh, believe that the biggest impacts of increasing visitation are not on the resources of the park. They're on the staff, they're on the operations, they're on the infrastructure. And that is something that we've got to focus on moving forward one way or the other. And I, I, there's some trade-off decisions that are going to have to be made across many units in the system in upcoming years is, is what I think. And those are, those are not going to be easy conversations. We're talking today with Cam Shawley, the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, about the state of Yellowstone. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Okay, we're back with Cam Shally, Yellowstone National Park Superintendent. Cam, visitation. There's always surveys being done to, to try and gauge the pulse of the visitors to Yellowstone National Park. Um, a lot of those surveys identified issues around your restrooms, congestion in the park, parking at specific sites during the peak season. How do you deal with that? I mean, um, you know, we're seeing some parks institute time time to entry reservation systems. Um, do, do you look to that? Do you build more parking lots and uh, put up more porta johns? Well, I've always said you're not going to build your way out of it. Uh, I think that it's contrary to people who believe every picture of a traffic jam at a wildlife crossing or something is representative of the way it is in the entire park all the time. Uh, I think it's important to separate fact from fiction a little bit. Now, there are clearly areas in this park and remember 2.2 million acre park, 1,750 acres are roads. Most people don't get more than a half mile away from their car. So there are clearly areas that we have serious issues at certain points in the year. The, ma the vast majority of this park, even in August, you can drive at speed limit or higher uh, with no issue. Um, I'm not recommending driving faster than the speed limit. I'm just saying that that's available. They haven't caught me uh, yet. <laughs> the uh, areas we're focused on most are Old Faithful, Midway Geyser Basin, Norris, and the Canyon Rims. Uh, not to say there's not issues in other places, but I think that, you know, I, I've said this in many forums. If you want to have a good time, uh, you start throwing out reservation systems and visitation caps to uh, local stakeholders, to businesses, to uh, state officials, to tourism fish officials, and we need to do what's right by the park first and foremost. That is the most important thing. At the same time, we need to understand the decisions we make have significant impacts um, on a variety of different people, you know, outside the park. And, you know, I, and I'm not the only one that believes this, but 
I don't think we're at a point right now where we need to be thinking about implementing a reservation system or a visitation cap um, anytime soon in Yellowstone. I think there are a lot of microgeographic actions that need to be taken. And we tried this pilot at Norris where basically didn't let people in once it got to a capacity level. We're looking at a rebuild of the parking lot at Midway Geyser Basin. We'll be launching an environmental assessment on that. We'll be removing the temporary parking lot when that happens. That will probably coincide with like a timed entry system in that particular area to because it's just overwhelmed, it's overrun. And that is an area that is a big concern to us. The Old Faithful rims, same type of thing. There's a bunch of pretty easy, uh, straightforward traffic management uh, actions that we can take to alleviate backups and congestion, maybe a little bit inconvenient for some of the visitors that feel like they want to go to a place whenever they want. But those are things that we're working on kind of incrementally as we move forward, simultaneously looking at and monitoring. We've got some of the most aggressive monitoring of resource impacts in the last three or four years that the park has ever done. And where are the most vulnerable resources? You know, we're seeing that we probably have seven to $10 million in boardwalk repairs that need to be made to protect geologic resources. That's something that's super important. Uh, we, we've done a shuttle feasibility study between, it just finished between Old Faithful and in Madison, it, it, you know, it's pretty expensive, you know, for people that think shuttles are the right uh, way to go. A lot of people disagree with that. Number one, it's probably a 50 to $80 million capital investment. It's building another uh, 800 space parking lot at Old Faithful. It's building an 800 space parking lot at Madison. It's putting in, you know, six, seven, eight shuttle stops in that small corridor, which is about 4% of the park's road 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 percentage um it's building a garage for the mechanics it's it's finding housing for the dispatchers and the drivers uh so a lot goes into the shuttle system in our survey in 2018 which as you know is one of the most comprehensive 95 percent of people said they should support a shuttle system um, as long as they don't have to use it mandatorily and so when you look at the trade-offs between the investment that would, and then on top of that, just for that corridor, it was an estimated nine to $12 million a year to operate. Where's that money going to come from? And, and, and so I'm not saying that shuttles aren't in the future. The other thing we hear from visitors is they like their autonomy to go where they want, when they want, stay as long as they want. If they want to pull into this pullout or this trailhead or fish for different locations on the Madison River, they want the flexibility to get in their car and do that. You really do remove a lot of that flexibility if you put a shuttle system in that's mandatory. I don't see any time in the near future, just from a cost standpoint, where a shuttle system is viable in Yellowstone National Park. On the on the reservation systems and the visitation cap, that is something we will need to think about at some point. I don't know exactly where that threshold is. I don't feel like we're there now. I do feel like a lot of the actions that we're taking are alleviating a lot of the most problematic areas. You know, we're testing some other things, the electric vehicle shuttles at Canyon in 21. That was, a, I think, a great pilot. Some, a lot of promise for that. That's, a partic that's an area where you have a large parking capacity and you have very defined areas where people want to visit Artist Point, Inter Inspiration Point, where a, a shuttle coming out of Canyon Village to those areas could work really well. But it's not like every place in the park is gridlocked all the time. And I'm not saying let's wait until that, until that happens. Um, but I feel like we're pretty far away from that. And there's a lot of work that's going to need to go into, you know, ultimately the more aggressive that we are with visitor management actions, we're going to need to have a well thought out plan that's supported by defensible resource impacts, impacts on staffing operations, visitor experience, whatever the case might be, you talk about dirty bathrooms and trash, that gets back to my point earlier about impacts on the staff. It's not that we're seeing massive resource degradation because of increasing visitation. What we are seeing is people complaining because the bathrooms are broken or they're dirty or uh, the trash cans are full or whatever the case is. And so there is a direct correlation with visitor experience, staffing levels. There's a direct correlation with resource impacts and staffing levels not going to fix it all with adding tons of staffing necessarily, but what we can do and in what time frame is heavily dependent upon uh, the resources that we have uh, to manage different issues around the park. 
You know, I just got back from a, a visit to Galapagos uh, National Park um, off the coast of Ecuador. And um, one of the most pristine areas, the wildlife is incredible. Um, the wildlife is not scared by human presence. It's just a phenomenal place to be. You know, one of the requirements that they have down there is if you're going into a protected area of the national park, that you go with a guide um, approved by the, the park service down there, the park. Yellowstone has the most incredible geothermal resources in the world. Um, very rare, pristine subject to degradation if, if it's not carefully monitored. W would guides work there or is that something that's, you know, not even thinkable? We, we currently have the most commercial use authorizations of any park in the system. I think we're at 400. Um, a vast majority of those are guides, outfitters, you know, wildlife guides, fishing guides. I think you're talking more specifically about guides for, you know, I don't know, Midway Geyser Basin or maybe more more specific areas. I, I think that's a, that's something that's worth looking at downstream, especially as we go into uh, uh, conversations about, you know, timed entry for certain locations or, you know, if we're going to um, really seeing certain areas being overrun by visitation, how do we control that more? And the guide system has been very successful. I will say that last year, you know, we did our best to get, even though the road was uh, generally impassable between here and Gardner, we allowed guides to come up on the traffic windows uh, and bring visitors from Gardner. And I, I got significant blowback because of that, because I wasn't letting normal visitors in. We couldn't because the road was under construction, but I, I think there's a place for that. I think we're exercising that um, in many ways very successfully um, around the park. And you know, I don't, I don't think that's a bad idea to look at uh, if it could work in certain areas. Yeah, the one thing that really impressed me with how they operated down there were the guides were just so incredibly knowledgeable. And uh, you know, if you wanted to know about um, you know, geology or botany or, or, you know, any of the allergies, they were experts on it. And it really, really rounded out our vacation and um, the, the knowledge we were able to um, absorb from that visit. And uh, I, I know um, park interpreters are another font of incredible information. And it'd be great if you had more of those uh, to help uh, with the visitation. Well, Cam, it's been great visiting with you today and, and going over the State of the Park report. Um, there's a lot more in there if, if people want to digest what's really going on in Yellowstone behind the scenes. Um, and they can find the report on your website, right? Yellow, NPS. On the website, as is the 2021 State of the Park as well. So. Right. I think the first State of the Park report from Yellowstone I encountered was back in 1991 when Mike Finley was uh, superintendent. And uh, I've been tempted to compare the two, but I don't know if it would be apples to apples or apples to oranges. Yeah, he did a volume actually in 99, I think, and uh, a little different. We tried to make ours, his, I think his it was in five different books. Um, it was kind of more of a, a snapshot over a longer period of time. What we tried to do with this was really, uh, number one, convey as many aspects of what we're doing in the park as possible, do it in a way that was a combination of good visuals, pictures, graphs, and then there is some some good narrative in there if people want to actually read more detail. Um, you know, so often people are busy and just kind of get to skim things. We want to make sure that the the document was was useful to a, a wide range of audiences. But it is a, a great representation of the team here and the great work that they're doing. Uh, it, like I said, does outline a bunch of the challenges that we have facing us, but uh, also some of the things that we're doing to address those challenges. So uh, thanks for uh, having me on, Kurt. Appreciate it. All right, Cam. Well, best of luck this summer with uh, crowds coming back and uh, road construction. That's Yellowstone National Park Superintendent Cam Shally discussing the park's State of the Park report. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Again, you can find Yellowstone's State of the Park report on the homepage of the park's website. Next week, we'll take a look at neighboring Grand Teton National Park, which also has to deal with crowds, even overcrowding, at certain times of the year in certain locations. The town leaders in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, are greatly concerned about sustainable tourism and have worked to develop a plan to not just preserve a healthy environment, 
but also to enhance the visitor experience, business growth, and quality of life for residents. Lynn Riddick recently visited with town leaders to explore what they've come up with, and she'll be back with that interview next week. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.